pleasure to be here. And um, Yes, Baruch Hashem. So, as I said, what are the, um, the list that's going around is basically to um, see if anybody first would like to get the Daily Dose of Amuna. What is the Daily Dose of Amuna? It is a daily um, email that um, gives like a little chizuk of, of Amuna. We'll talk a little bit about what Amuna means and what does that mean. Um, and, uh, and, and in addition to the Daily Dose of Amuna, like I said, we're starting next Monday for 40 days, what we call a global gratitude revolution. Um, hundreds of women are joining us. It's basically to sign up to every day get a, a little um, reminder, a boost, a practical piece of advice on how to increase your gratitude every day for 40 days, starting Monday up until Rosh Chodesh Nisan for 40 days. Why 40? Because 40 has to do with a re rebirthing process. When a person does something bahatmada, like constantly for 40 days, then they're able to really uplift themselves and hopefully be, um, it becomes no, no more than, it, it becomes their, their second nature. Basically, you know, they're, they're able to adapt to it, to that type of new uh, something that they took upon themselves. So we invite everyone to join into this, uh, you know, to, to increase gratitude five minutes a day just to sort of have a good sense of thanking Hashem for the little things in life, the big things in life. That's what life is about. I also brought my books here if anybody is interested in a turnaround book. It's uh, my, uh, my first book. It came out a couple of months ago. It's a six-month program of learning Amuna every day. Basically, you open up the book, you learn the Amuna lesson, and there's a practical, also a practical piece of advice. And uh, Baruch Hashem, a lot of women have already gone through the six-month program and have said, you know, that it's really helped them. So I'm going to, uh, to look at that later as well. Um, so I was asked to talk today about Amuna and children and some practical pieces of advice. Right, Shoshana? That's what we're discussing today. Mm -hmm. So, um, so maybe we'll also keep it to like sort of because it's a smaller crowd. We can also keep it to like an open forum. I'll talk a little bit. You, you know, everyone feel free to raise their hand, jump in, and ask questions, challenge, um, you know, clarify whatever it is. I, you know, enjoy that sort of open forum so we can really work together uh, to try to make this make this work. So let's talk just a little bit about Amuna and what is Amuna. Let's first talk about what Amuna is not. Amuna is not blind faith. That's what Amuna is definitely not. It's not the type of thing that when I'm told by our when we're told by our sages, when we're told by the Rebbeim, have Amuna. It doesn't mean the Amuna that they speak about in the churches. When you don't, when you can't explain something, have Amuna. So have faith. They depict it. They describe it as something very blind. Where's the, wait a Where's the email address? It went around. I don't know. The green uh, folder. Here it is. Could you put so, email? So what we're so so what we're trying um, to to define is what it's not because unfortunately we're very very heavily affected and very heavily influenced by the idea of seeing the Western culture, the Christian culture, come up on the podium and say, have faith, have faith. When do they say to have faith? When they have no explanation. Well, we just have to have faith. So we have got it now into our minds that faith, which Amuna is not, when soon I'm going to tell you what it is, having faith is, 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 in their definition, is something blind. It's something abstract. But Amuna, what we are taught, what Torah teaches us, is that Amuna is faithfulness. And there's a difference between faith and faithfulness. Faithfulness means I know something and I am faithful to it. Not only is um, Amuna faithfulness, it's ne'emanut, it is also called ne'aliot ne'eman, to be loyal. It's also loyalty. So here we're already defining it, that Amuna is not something blind. I'm faithful towards something, I'm loyal towards something. Yet on the other hand, if you're talking about faith, it's something blind. I believe in something, but what is that? So here we could see that the Torah definition 
of emuna means that there has to be something that I believe in. I have to be loyal. When am I loyal? I'm loyal at a certain circumstance. When is loyalty, for instance, tested? So, for instance, we want to talk about children, yes? My children can, can understand that I'm loyal to them. I show to my children that I am loyal to them when in spite of the fact that they do things that are not proper, I'm still always there. Mommy's always there for you. The door is always open. No matter what brings you down, no matter what mistakes you've done, I am always there for you. That's loyalty. That means that it's an unconditional connection no matter what. And that's what loyalty is in a marriage too, honey. Even during those times where you're, you've gone through difficulties and you've um, you know, not been the best husband in town, and, not, and have not been the best husband in town, or you know, we're going through tough times, whatever the case may be, I'm loyal to this marriage. I'm going to make this work, and it's not conditional. This is unconditional faithfulness. We are together. I believe in this. I, I, I'm putting everything that I have in this. That's what we want to now explore. What does that mean in terms of Judaism? Hashem doesn't want us to have this abstract faith because we see time and time again Hashem says I want you to learn what I want you to I want you to study Torah I want you to get to know me you should get to know me when today but wait a minute today is today tomorrow what about tomorrow you also have to say every day Hashem wants us to get to know him and it doesn't say you should know today not you should believe today in other words Hashem is asking us for a level of actual knowledge, because when I know something, then I'm sure about it, and I feel more secure in that. So, what does Amuna do? Where does Amuna fit into that Yadata Hayam? What it fits in is that Hashem says, I want you to get to know me through the Torah. What is the Torah? The Torah is a personal letter that Hashem wrote to the Jewish people. And depending on where I am in my life, it speaks to me differently, which is why we're commanded to learn it year after year. Because the way I learned Bereshit last year is going to speak to me totally different than I, what, it, what it speaks to me right now. Because I'm in a different place. I've grown. I'm in, I, I might have had certain disyonot. So now I'm depicting and taking out certain lessons from, let's say, this Parsha versus that Parsha, which didn't speak to me last year. But this year, wow, I'm going through the same things as, I don't know, uh, Abraham and Sarah. I'm having problems having children, so maybe that speaks to me more. Whatever the case is, we can always find ourselves in the Torah somehow or another. And so that's why we need to constantly learn it over and over again. Hashem wants us to. But on the other hand, when we get to a point where we no longer understand, there's plenty of things that we don't understand. How many times do we try to understand Hashem and we don't? What does Hashem say? I want you to go, I want you to look into it, but after you've explored it and you see that you can no longer grasp it with your intellectual mind, then you let it go. But you're not letting it go into the space. You're letting it go to fall into the hands of Torah. Torah catches that which my, my mind lets go. For instance, I'm running into a problem and it feels like no matter what I'm doing, I feel the dinim, I feel the judgments, I feel the difficulty. I'm having problems with my children, I'm having problems with my husband, I'm having problems with Parnassah, whatever the case may be. And I'm davening and I'm trying and I'm improving and I'm growing and it's not speaking to me. And now I'm starting to feel isolated. Now I'm starting to feel like Hashem doesn't care about me. Why are you listening to me, Hashem? What haven't I tried to do? I've increased my kavana, and I've been mevater, and I've learned anger manage one, two, three, and number 110, and I'm still not the person I want to be, and I start feeling isolated. Now I go back into the Torah. I don't, I, I don't know what you want from me, Hashem. I go back into the Torah, and I remember that which I learned, that Hashem loves me, that Hashem said that He is our Father, and that he only wants for our good. And that's what I believe in. That is what's called Amuna. And I'm faithful to learning that, to that teaching. I am faithful to that. It's like my husband who might be angry at me, 
But I, re I remember he even says to me over and over again, you know I have this anger problem, you know I'm like this, you know I'm like that, but I love you. And so I remember that during difficult times, and that's where I grab the koach, the strength, to be able to get through this difficult time of darkness and confusion. So do we have a little bit of clarity in terms of understanding Amuna? Anybody have questions on what I just said? Kind of understanding. Okay. So the idea of Amuna, I want to talk a little bit about emotional health, because in order to bring up our children, in order for us to be proper role models, I, first of all, have to have love of myself. I have to believe in myself. Amuna in today's generation is Amuna of myself. I have to believe in my greatness. I have to believe in my godliness. I have to believe that Hashem has invested a godly spark, a part of Him, so to speak. Right? He, in, he invested it in me. And trust me that I'm going to take this spark and I'm going to become godly. I'm going to rep represent him well. That's a huge responsibility. And if Hashem invested that in me, then I have a huge responsibility to live up to the program, to make sure that I carry the task, that I don't schlep this godly you know, spark into the dumpster with, with, with my you know, mistakes and my, my you know, bodily temptations and pleasures and such and so forth. So the idea for me is, what I need to understand is, if I go back, even though I make mistakes, and even though I fall, and even though I've tried, and I still seem to be weighed down by my lowliness, by the Yetzirah, by whatever, however you want to call it, Amalek, Yetzirah, the Satan, however you want to, they're all the same. The fact that I'm dragged down, I have to have Amuna in myself. I have to know that Hashem... Let's put it this way. When you plant a beautiful garden and you see weeds, you go and you pull them out. They serve no purpose. If anything, they damage the garden. They pull away the nutrients from the other flowers. So you right away pull them out. If Hashem is keeping me alive in this world, all of us is keeping us alive in this world, it means that we have a purpose in His garden. Because if not, we would have to be taken away. Now, it could be that my being taken away has a purpose too. That also could be. But so long as I'm here, I serve a purpose in the cosmic creation of called Earth, planet Earth. And that means that Hashem is investing His godliness, His greatness in me. He's nourishing me through nishima, breath from nishama. He's every time I breathe, what am I breathing? That's why, mechadesh betuvot hamimasek bereshit. Every moment, is a new moment of life. Because with every breath of the person try not to breathe for a moment, you feel that death. You feel that death. So how do we know every moment we get life? One second, we don't breathe and we, 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 we're disconnected from life. How much we gasp for the air. So we understand that every moment Hashem is investing His nishima, His nishama, so to speak, in us. There must be a good, I must be serving a, a purpose for it. I must be, there must be something amazing that I have yet to accomplish or that I'm accomplishing and Hashem needs for me to finish, whatever the case may be. So the first thing, if I have issues with myself, if I have issues with Hashem, if I don't have a Muna in Hashem, I can certainly not represent Hashem to my children. And I certainly can't represent Hashem and I call us all Amuna representatives. We all sell Amuna. We all sell Hashem. We, we represent Hashem every moment of living. My children, I, I have to sell Hashem to my children. My, my children have to see that I am connected like this to Hashem. That no matter what happens to me, I'm one with Him. If it's the, in the way I speak, if it's in the way that I am, if it, they see me, I'll give you an example. I, I remember hearing this story, it was a very, very powerful story, of, of, of a family who got out of the Holocaust, and they were, the, the husband and, and the wife were very loyal to keeping Shabbat. They said, we're going out, even though whatever happened, Shabbat is Shabbat, I'm keeping Shabbat. And during those times when they came to America, they, didn't re they weren't really warmly accepted, and so whenever he found a job, when he started finding a job, Friday, he would always get the pink slip because he said to them, I can't work on Saturday. And he would get the pink slip. And that's how he went from week to week to week to week. He would go work a week, pink slip. Work a week, get a pink slip. Now here he has a choice. 
He's already doing Raton Hashem. The question is, how am I taking it in? How am I accepting the Gzera? Hashem is testing me now. He's saying, you're loyal to me. But are you loyal? Really loyal? Are you besimcha? Are you accepting it? Or are you, again, that's a big, I mean, again, there's different levels of accepting. There's just accepting intellectually. There's accepting with love. Then there's accepting with simcha. Those are three different levels of, of accepting. But where am I? First, I have to accept, but if I'm accepting with a, with a, oh my gosh, well, that's a very poor level of accepting. That's accepting, but we have to try to work towards lifting that up. So when he would come home, he would sit down and he would say, oh, how hard it is to be a Jew. And you know what? Every single one of his children went off the derech. Why did he did the right thing? He kept the Shabbos, but what message did he give to his children? Being a Jew is very, very hard. It's true. It's it's very hard, but there's a great reward. There's it's a it's a hard job to become godly. It's not an easy. It's, it's not easy to emulate God. It's not easy, but look what the reward is. You're you're really you know attached to the giver of it all. And we have to remember, this world is not the end, right? If, unless, yeah. unless we take that into consideration and we understand that this is one stage in our life. We have to understand, death is not the end. Death is a part of life. It's going and continuing living in a different format. But we think as death as, oh, the person's gone. He's not gone. He just, it's like the age of three, you have the upsharing. The age of five, you go to kindergarten. The age of 120, you go to Olam Abba. It's literally a stage in life. It's not the end. And unless we understand that, then of course it's going to seem all horrific and all unjust. But you have to take that very vital piece called eternity and not forget that that's part of a person's life because the soul continues to live just it sheds its body, the body form, which will later, it'll be reunited. But I mean, right now it just doesn't need it for that. You know, like sometimes you need certain things in life and then Ten years later, oh, I don't really need that anymore. It was good for me ten years ago. Well, the body was great for us till 120. After 120, I don't need it anymore. I don't need it there in the Olam Abad. It did its purpose. Now I'm done with it. I'll meet you again later when it comes to, you know, Tchiyat HaMetim, Be'ez Hashem. So the idea is, is if I don't take care of my own cheshbon, my own emotional, imuna relationship with Hashem, there's no way that I can... I can pass that on to my children. Chinuch Yiladim, bringing up our children, begins and ends with Shlom Bayit. It's, it's, if you want to know how to bring up your children, you have to look at your relationship with your husband. If you live a happy life, and happy life meaning I'm accepting. It doesn't necessarily mean that I'm hum, hubby, hubby dubby all day long with my husband. But if I could basically say that I really do accept the circumstances of my life, if, I could, if my children see the sense of acceptance, even a sense of simcha, Hashem loves me even though it's difficult, Hashem loves us. Words like that, playing the music, the, the children see that the parent, the par at least one of the parents, and let me tell you, even if it's just the mother, you would, how many stories do I hear of children who grow up in families where the father may be doing this, but the mother was really strong with the Yiddishkeit, she davened, she prayed. The Chafetz Chaim, till today says, he, he writes in all his books, that he is the Chafetz Chaim because of his mother. Because of the tears that his mother cried, that's why he's the Chafetz Chaim. With every tear, he says that that's another tear built the Chafetz Chaim. So we see the power of the mother. You, uh, sometimes the husband is not indirect. That also is a tikkun. That's also a tikkun. We could talk about that after. But in general, the mother, if she has it put together, if she accepts the circumstances of her life, if she understands that Hashem put her together with her husband for a reason, it's not that Hashem punished. Hashem didn't punish any of us. Hashem brought us into this world. I don't know if anyone knows, but according to the Arizal, very few women are in this world for their own sake. Almost every one of us are here in order to fix our husbands. We're not meant to be reincarnated. Women aren't meant to be reincarnated. We were meant to come down once, do our job, and go back and never see this world again. But we keep coming back because of our husbands. <laughs> Our husbands mess up and we have to come here to fix them. But it could be that the last time we were here, we were the man and he was the woman. That could be too. 
We all at one point were the opposite sex. I don't know if everyone knows. At one point, we were all men. So, yes, we were all men, every single and, one and of us. And if you didn't finish your kikun first time, you're coming again? Yes. To, again to be with your husband. Right. <laughs> That's a real kikun. Yeah. So the idea is, is if we, if we don't um, at the least bit try to really work on our amuna and really have that close relationship, how do I do that? I had a really tough day. I had the mortgage guy call me and I had problems with checks coming back, whatever the case may be. My job is to settle my own emotional account as much and as quickly as possible before I have to meet up now with my children and my spouse. When they're not at home or when they're sleeping, I need to collect myself. I need to put myself in a room and I need to realign myself. How do I realign myself? I have a self-therapy, a self-talk conversation as many times as I need with Hashem. I settle my account. I settle the score. I don't wait for Rosh Hashanah. It's a very heavy baggage once a year to let go of all my guilt and my burden and my anger and my whatever else negativity, my frustration, my depression, whatever it is that I might complain towards Hashem. We don't wait once a year. A good Jew does a self-accounting every single day, a few times a day. While I'm washing the dishes, I can do a self-accounting. But a Jew has to empty out their, their, their slate. We have, when we say Jewish guilt, Jewish mother's guilt, that's just that's not a joke. We really are always feeling guilty. And that guilt weighs us down so much that it could be that everything is fine, but that the only negativity that I'm carrying with me is my own, that I created for my own. And then what happens? My kids go through the door, and even if I want to be a good mother, I can't because I'm my worst enemy. I'm badgering my own self. So, and, and I don't even have any complaints to Hashem, but it, 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 again, it goes into a vicious cycle. So I have to first take care of my own self. How do you do the self account? Is there a process or just... So I'll, I'll tell you what Rabbi Nachman teaches, that's all, the way he suggests, but there is absolutely no fit formula to it. Generally speaking, the best way to do it, and that's one of the reasons why I created this gratitude revolution, is if you want to really start learning Amuna, first you have to work on gratitude. First you have to appreciate that which you have. First, you have to look at your plate and say, what is it that I have? I'm, I'm just going to give you uh, just a small example. If actually, we have a white plate here. This is a real study that they did in, in a college. The professor got up in front of a whole classroom in college, and he picked up a white plate, a white um, uh, paper. This is a white plate, whatever. And he picked it up, and, he said, and, and inside this white piece of paper, he had a little small black dot. And he picked it up in front of the class and he showed everyone. And he says, I want everyone to tell me what you see here. And so most of the class answered a black dot. A very few people answered white, pa white uh, paper. And so this, is, this is, goes to show how we look at things. The white paper is huge compared to a little black dot. And yet all I do is focus on that little black dot. And that's Yetzirah. That's Amalek. We're in the month of Adar. We're supposed to wipe out Amalek. That's Amalek. Uh, what did Amalek do? We got out of Mitzrayim. We were motivated. We were inspired. We were just shown ten plagues. Hashem just split the sea. What did Hashem do to show that he loved us? And we still sat there and complained. And we had doubts. Because everything that, in comparison, let's just say they went into the Midbar and there was no food. But how can you compare that to what big Hashem did. You, everything is a, a scale. Yes, I have problems with one kid, but I have five others who are great. Yes, I have a booboo on one finger, but my rest of my body is okay. Yes, I have issues maybe with some of the things my husband does, but he does do some things that are good. Why can't we look with pink eyeglasses? And it's all in the glasses. Do you know there's a mashal in general about everything the way we look at life. You know, if your glasses are dirty, you look and you could s look inside a room and you could say, look at all this smoke, look at all these specks of dust. And then you realize, oh, it was just my glasses. The room is really clean. It's all the way I choose to see. Did I clean my glasses? And the way to clean your eye lenses is through Amuna. 
is for through understanding and knowing that if Hashem made it like this, this is the best possible option that could have ever been given to me. In other words, if there were three buckets here and Hashem presented me all three and said, listen, you've got to choose one. You've got to go through a tikkun. You've got to go through some rectification of your soul. Sorry, you have a debt to pay. You've got to go through difficulties. Here are three choices. You choose. You would definitely choose in, your, in our small-mindedness, we would still choose the same cup that Hashem gave us out of all three because it's the best possible option. So in other words, I might have had a fender bender and it's a really big pain because, you know, I just got the car fixed or whatever have you, but maybe the other cup was a horrible accident and now I just had the fender bender. Now, I won't ever know that there was supposed to be a horrible accident, so I'm just focusing on the fender bender. But this is, this is where trust comes in. The trust comes in is here. I don't understand why you did this, Hashem. But I trust, again, Banim atem lahashem elokechem kulchem hayom. Hashem is saying, you are my children. And I always have to remember, I'm your child, Hashem. I'm your child, Hashem. I know you love me. I know you love me. I don't know what's going on here, but I know I'm in good hands your where does a child go mommy mommy she knows instinctively we have to develop that instinct we have to develop that instinct that right away when something goes wrong not right away to take out the box the boxing gloves to say i'm gonna fight this with all my might no to say i'm gonna hug this because this is the best possible thing that could have happened to me out of all the choices that could have been it's easy to say right well, when we're here, we're here. To, you know what? You know what we're doing here. We all have a nice amuna box inside our heart. We're stuffing it now. We're stuffing it, and we're stuffing it, and we're 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 jam packing the storage house of our amuna, so that God forbid, God forbid, when a little frustration or a big difficulty comes along, I could start pulling, pulling, pulling. And then when it calms down, again, I go stuffing, 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 and then I go pulling, pulling, pulling. And that's, that's the avoda. That is the way it is through life. Don't expect anything differently. I'm not here to sell you a garden. That is life. Working on ourselves, strengthening us like a, like a soldier. In between war, what do they do? They go, they train, they, they, they sweat, they, right? They learn more techniques. How do I fight the enemy? And then they're ready to confront the enemy. Then they're tired, they're exhausted, they go for a rest. And again, training, right? That is us. We're in a war here. Do we understand? We're in a war with Amalek. And until the end of days, until Mashiach doesn't come, we are in that war. So if you're looking for pina coladas on a beach, you're in the wrong scene. It's not happening. We're here to work. Adam la mol yulad. I mean, can't, we can't change the reality. The, we are here to work. After 120, talk to me about pina coladas. But now, we're working. The question is, if I don't fight... The, the, if I don't fight the one that's giving me chesed, but that I, I'm, I'm mistaking the, 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 the one on my team, Hashem on my team, from the, for the enemy, and I'm fighting him, and I'm rebelling against him, and there's a masha, what happens, lahavdi, lahavdi, the Baal Shem Tov HaKadosh says, what happens when you go, lahavdi, yes, to tie down a horse? The owner goes to tie down a horse. He wants to keep his horse safe. He wants to make sure the horse doesn't run into the fields, get eaten up, get lost, can't find his way home. What does he do? He ties him around with ropes against the pole. Now, the horse has a choice. Is the horse going to say, what are you tying me up and start kicking and whatever? And then the, what happens to the owner? The owner gets all frustrated. He takes the rope and starts tying him even tighter around the head, right? That's us. What am I doing? Hashem's tying me. There's a reason why he's tying me. He's saying to me, it's not good for you here, or you have to wake up because of this. You're not doing something right over here. He gives me problems with my children. He says, this one needs more attention. That's why he gives me a problem with my kid. He says, this one, this one right here, the one you weren't thinking about, she needs a lot of attention. He needs a lot of attention. Hashem's telling me something. So what am I doing? Am I fighting it? Oh, Hashem, why did you do this to me? Why did you give me such a chill? Da, 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 da. Am I fighting or am I saying, Hashem, listen, I really need help. I don't know what to do with this child. I don't know what to do with myself. You want me to know what to do with my child? I'm totally at lost here. I don't know what my tikkun is. You want me to know what my child's tikkun is? I don't know how to bring myself to do what's right and fight my own Yetzirah. You want me to help me my, with my child? I don't know nothing, Hashem. Please help me here. Bring me the right shlichim. Send me the right psychiatrist. Whatever. What medicine do I give to my kids? Whatever it is. 
help me. Because Hashem says, I didn't send you the problem and tell you, bye, see ya, after 120, come back, write me a telegram. That's not how Hashem sent us down into this world. He sent us down into this world, and He says, when you have a problem, call me up and I'll come and I'll help you. That's why we say brachas, because we remind ourselves, Baruch atah, I remind myself, Hashem is with me. Baruch atah, I'm not saying Baruch Hu, Baruch atah, what does that mean atah? Blessed are you, you, you. That means I'm saying to myself, you, you, Hashem, you're here. And how many times do we say brachas a day? Like quite a few, 100. The David HaMelech says 100 times we have to say it. Look how many times we have to remind ourselves. David HaMelech and Ruach HaKodesh knew. 100 times a day you have to remind yourself Hashem is with you. So I'm going to make you thirsty and I'll make you hungry and then you have to go to the bathroom and then you'll have to do this and then you'll have to say this bracha, this bracha, this netila, this bukat shachar. Because you have to be reminded, because I know how easy it is to forget when you're in this world. You're, it's very easy to forget about me. So I'll make you say brachas. So we fight and we mumble the bracha. We don't understand. We're doing ourselves chesed. We're doing chesed with ourselves. We're, we're reminding ourselves that we're not alone. We're reminding ourselves that Hashem is with us. So at the end of the day, if I'm not representing simcha and acceptance and kesha with Hashem, for instance, I had a bad day. I had a bad day at work, my boss bothered me, whatever the case may be. I don't have to hide that from my children. I don't have to play that everything is fine. I could sit down with my child and I could say to my child, even if my child is three years old, I could sit down with my child and I could say, you know what, mommy had a really hard day. You wouldn't believe this cashier did this and the person at the bank, I don't know who hired him, he died, really, the boss really, they have been neglecting their whole, you know, customer service and but you know what? Mommy had a really hard day, but you know what? Hashem was there. Hashem helped me. I, I, you know, you know, I could say, I can use it as an amunah. You know what Mommy did at that moment when I was upset? I turned up and I said, Hashem, Hashem, can you please help me? Can you please take this person away from me? Or, I can use it as an amunah lesson. I can express to the children when I have a problem. You know where Mommy goes? Mommy goes to Hashem. You know, you don't understand what I'm saying? So that is chinuch yeladim. That is bringing and instilling emunah, but not only in myself. I'm instilling it in my, and then my husband overhears that. Now, okay, let's talk about, which I get a lot of times. A lot of times in our generation, us women seem to be a little bit more stronger in Yiddishkeit many, many times than in our everything. husbands. In okay, well, in, in, in terms of Yiddishkeit, in terms of, you know, I, I get a lot of calls from women, literally from all around the world, Men don't want to get up to Minya and they're on the computer till 3 in the morning. They've lost their, their, their umph to want to, you know, be connected and learn and so on and so forth. What, what to do? We are not here to change anyone. I'm not here to change my children. I'm not here to change my neighbor. I'm not here to definitely change my parent. Nobody. I'm here to change myself. When I go up to 120, after 120, they're going to ask us, why didn't we become who we were supposed to be? Reb Zusha says... After 120, they're not going to ask him why was he not Gadol like Moshe Rabbeinu. They're going to ask him why weren't you Gadol like Reb Zusha. But his name is Zusha. He was Gadol. There's still, if there's going to be a little bit of a gap between that, the Zusha that he was, and the Zusha that he could have been, he's going to be held accountable for that. So at the end of the day, we learn that we're accountable to be the best that we can be. Now, what does that mean? We don't know. We only ask that Hashem, please don't let us leave this world without finishing our tikkun. We want to be the best that we can be. Hashem, help me be your Evid. Help me love to be your Evid. Help me not fight being your Evid. I want to serve you. I don't want to serve my own foolish, false needs. I don't want to run after stupidity in this world and then realize after 120 I wasted my whole life away. Help me see the truth. Help me see the essential aspects of life, the ikar, and help me throw away the tafel. Help me throw away what's not essential to me. I don't want to be busy looking around at what color curtain I have, if it's this shade gray or this shade blue. or That's not essential in my life. It's important for me that my house has a warm feeling because I want Hachnas Esorchim to come in my house. I want it to have co uh, comfy chairs so that people will feel comfortable sitting at the Shabbat table. That's Ikar. But for me to look, if it's this color versus that color because I had this Mishigas in my head, I mean, it happens. We're all, we're all human. But I, that's, technically, I don't want to be messing around with that all my life. I want to be, you know, using my time. Every moment is precious. We know that. And so that's what, that's what we ask for. So, so the idea of us 
spending time in this world changing ourselves, I want to just explain a very, very, very vital, important message that we need to all understand. We are projectors. We're mirrors. That's all we are in life. If we see something, it's because that we, we have ourselves in that. I'll give you an example. You walk down the street and you see a Spanish lady, not even one of ours, a Spanish lady screaming at the top of her lungs at her child. That's something usually you don't pay attention to. Sometimes you might just because it might be loud or whatever have you. There's a message in there. Why did Hashem have me see this lady scream at her children? It's because Hashem is telling me, you, see that? Doesn't this feel, doesn't look good for you, right? It makes you feel uncomfortable, like, yuck, that's not so nice the way she's just screaming. Oh, look at that poor kid. You did that. You did that. And Hashem is showing you through the Spanish lady that you did that. If you see a woman walking down the street, not dressed snua, it's because you have a lacking of tzniut inside of you. I didn't say to be paranoid, but if something, I didn't say, oh, Hashem, you're saying, um, you said message, message, here, message here. oh no, what are you, if you notice it, right? you, like, that's it, if it screams at you, if it catches your attention, you need to sit down and you need to say to yourself, it bo- exactly. It would bother me if I saw any like woman. You yeah. yeah, you you know, you know, yeah. You you it's a stirring. It's called the stirring of your heart. You know, it moved you, it touched that note. Right? If you're on if you're sitting on the bus and you hear a girl speaking on the phone in a not sanua way and it bothers you, like, yuck, that was like why did I have to hear that? That's your private conversation, it's none of my business. That means there's something the way that I speak sometimes. Maybe I don't pay attention, that I'm, I don't have boundaries in the way that I'm speaking. Everything, it has Baal Shem Tov this is all life. The whole world is just a projection of myself. It's all a school out there. Everyone's here to teach me. That's why I have no, I shouldn't be angry at my neighbor for not being grateful for the, the fact that I ser- brought her a piece of cake and she didn't say thank you to me. That means I'm ungrateful. I shouldn't be upset with my husband if he is not treating me nice. Why? Because it could be that I need to be not treated nice. Again, we're not talking abuse. Please, let's make it very, very clear. I am not talking about verbal or physical abuse. Make it very clear. Let's keep the boundaries where they need to be. What is not nice? He says something like, um, why is the house, like for me, I'll tell you what's not nice for me. Why is the house not, I don't understand, why is it such a mess? Why, what, what are you doing all day? Right? <laughs> Couldn't that happen? That's not nice. I gotta tell you, I go in the corner and I cry my eyes out. No, really, I'm very sensitive like that. I try to keep the house in order. No, you tell me something like that, like, like, what were you doing all day? Oh, I was on the phone with Mary and, you know, Uncle Lou and I, what do you mean, what was I doing all day? I, you know, really? So, so that situation, Quiet, quiet, go, no, well, if I cry, then let me cry to Hashem, because if you cry because of something your husband did, you're putting him in danger, he can, if he walks out of the house while you're crying, he's actually in danger, you have now a malach hamavet sitting on his head, I'm not, I promise you, I'm not, I am not exaggerating, he has to do berkata gomel when he comes back home, that he came home safely. It is, there's, there's many, many uh, um, true stories in the Gemara that talk is that about it. That a wife's tear, that Every wife tear that she cries. Forget about it. You have no idea how powerful our tears are. I mean, I could talk about that in a minute. What's the power of a tear? But if we cry and we're upset with our Shem, we go right, we're upset with, our, uh, upset with our, our child or whoever it is. My neighbor, I'm ex- uh, you know, that's also Mikadrig. I'm, I'm, you know, prosecuting that person with my tears. Hashem says, my child is crying. Who did that? And then he right away, uh, in Shemaim, there's a court. There's actually a bed dean. There's 24 courts, one every hour in Bet Din of Shemaim for every single person. Every hour we stand trial up in Shemaim. So and so, you cry for somebody. no, no. If you're going to cry because somebody hurt you, hurt you, it's it's it, there's a problem with that. There's a problem with that. Another question. You said if you see somebody screaming, right, and yeah. you feel bad, but you know it's not it's not good, and you're doing the same thing. What is it? You, know, so you have to be metal. You say, thank you, Hashem, for showing it to me. Now I know what it I looks like. It no, but you're doing it. You know it's wrong, and you're doing it. Uh, so you, but do, you, do you acknowledge? But now you have yeah. that. You have that. No, but anyway, before I knew it. And I, ga- and I guarantee you that if you look at that person and you understand that that's a lesson for you, you saw that screaming, and you understand that's a lesson for you, you're not going to scream the same way. I'll tell you why. 
No, no, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. You might have screamed for eight minutes, usually, and I guarantee you you're screaming for seven minutes and 59 seconds. <laughs> you have definitely lessened the screaming. If it was even the decimals, you usually scream, ah! Now you're, uh, you, something has changed. I'm telling you, you don't under. Maybe it's changed for worse. How I know it's No, you have to have it. That, well, how did we start off this year? Have a Muna in yourself that you yeah. are capable of uplifting yourself from this. And dive into Hashem. Let Hashem help you. Listen, you're not going to. Hey, no, because sometimes you know it's wrong, and it's like on purpose you're doing it. You know, it's like it's not on your will. You don't want to do it, but you're doing it. <laughs> It's not by purpose. First of all, it's definitely not by purpose. It's, sub, it's, a, it's an automatic habit. We have to train ourselves. Listen, we're used to screaming. We're used to criticizing. We're used to belittling, belittling our husbands. You know how many of us belittle our, our husbands? Do you have, I, I'm, I could probably, without knowing anybody here, I'm saying half of us that probably criticize our husbands and make them feel like dirt. And that's why a lot of them don't do and live up to their godliness because we're like their mother. Let me teach you something about Shalom Bayit. Something that'll blow your minds away, okay? You want to have a perfect marriage? You have to divide your marriage up into four categories. And do the best that you can in each one of those categories. And if you only are good in three out of the four categories, you're already missing out. You have to try to attend to your marriage and to your husband in these four categories to the best of your knowledge. Number one. I'm going to go through each one in, and, and elaborate on it, but first let's just categorize it. We have to, we have to, um, we have to um, treat our husband like a mother treats her son. That's one category. I'm going to go through it right after. Treat our husband like a wife treats a husband. Treat our husband like a daughter treats her father. And treat our husband like a sister treats her brother. It's a little confusing. We're going to go over it. How do we do that? First thing, how do we treat our husband as a wife? Uh, we'll go through the easiest one. As a wife and a husband, intimacy. Intimacy, 25% of a relationship, of a spousal relationship, you ha that ha somehow or another that has to be fulfilled. That intimate, you know, physical intimacy has to be fulfilled. And if it's not person's missing out on 25% of, of a completed healthy marriage. The other 25% is as a sister treats her, her brother. What is that? Most of us do fabulous in this. Honey, can you go and pick up, uh, you know, 3% milk from the store? Oh, don't forget to run to the pharmacy, right? Regular, everyday Monday. Pick the child from the, from the gun today and don't forget to pick up the papers from Mr. Lulu and whatever. Well, right? That's like everyday Monday. And the truth is, most marriages that fail, it's because they were very much like a sister and brother and had no other part of the other three parts of the relationship. They lived together as roommates. There was nothing else but roommate interaction. They spoke. They might have even not fought. But there was nothing, no essential, you know, uh, completion of the relationship. And the other, now we, got, we went through the two relationships. Now the third, the third category, and this is a part where so many of us are lacking, and this is where most marriages fail, is to treat our husbands as a daughter treats a father. What does that mean? How does a daughter look up to her father? She goes, Daddy, can you show me how to work this piece of, I don't know, phone? Maybe you know how to fix this. Well, usually it just doesn't happen in today's generation. It's, it's the opposite. The, fa the father, okay, was a bad example. But whatever, you know what I mean. Or, Abba, I learned this in school. Can you teach me the halacha? I know you said something on the Shabbos table. Whatever it is. It's that looking up to the figure as if he's a father and I'm a little child and I rely on you. You're the man of the house. I rely on you. I lean on you. I need you. I, 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 you make me feel secure. I feel like you're bigger and larger than me. That is a part that most of us as wives fail to fit into the, you know, the, the, the general picture of spousal relationship. And last but not least, you have the relationship, which most of us are okay with this, hopefully we are, is as a mother treats her son. 
Honey, come through the door. Let me get you a glass of water. You look really tired. Do you need some Tylenol? Maybe I... <laughs> have you been having a head... We're motherly, right? Where's your underwear? Did you get me underwear for three days? I haven't seen any underwear in the wash for three days. You know, whatever it is, right? Usually we're okay with that. We're overly okay with that, right? You know, we go ahead and we take care. Take some chicken soup. Your nose is red and all that stuff. But the most important thing is that we have that balance. We have to have that balance between all four categories in order to say that we have a steady marriage. And what, is, what should he do for us, though? I says, <laughs> if I would be talking in front of men, I'd be giving advice to men, but I'm talking to women. Let the rabbis take care of the husbands. I need to take care of myself. I need to do what I'm supposed to do. I, I'm very, not it's very hard to ask a husband to show us something because we're so independent. In That's a way, right. we take care of things like this. Do you, call, yes. do, you call, do, you ever, do you ever recall the idea of Hollywood? Hollywood, oh, Broadway oh, shows, oh, be an actress. Yeah. Even if you know a halacha, say, honey, I, what are you supposed to, You could call him up from work and say, what are you supposed to do when I actually took the meat spoon and I put it in a dare? Like, what are you supposed You taught me this. I don't remember. Right. Make up an excuse. But you know, sometimes it's a problem because... Many times women say, I have to be an actress, I have to act. I don't want to be, he should take me whatever I, as is. I don't want to play. Can I tell you something? When you this is most time they right. don't want to play. Can I yeah, tell, but can I tell you something? When you have a, hus a happy husband, because he feels like he's king of the house, who gains? The wife. But there you go. I've answered it. You know what? It's worth being an actress if you end up getting to be a queen. I understand. So then that's it. Just telling you. I know. I and I and I'm not saying. They not. Right. But they you don't agree with this. That's okay. They they don't have to agree. You know what? That person ends up only losing. Right. You end up losing if you're not willing to invest. You have to invest, and there always is going to be a korban in the house. What it, you know? We just learned last week about the whole yan of the mishkan. The house is today our mishkan. The table is the, is the shuhan, right? The, uh, the altar where the korbanot are. And so we have to understand that our home is a place of korbanot. There's always going to be someone who has to be makriv, someone who has to self-sacrifice, and it's going to generally be the mother. It's going, and we're meant to be that way. Why? Not because we're, we're less. The opposite, it's because Hashem gave us the koach to be able to be mavater. Hashem gave us the koach to be able to be mavater, because again, what did I say? We're here probably, most probably, to fix our husbands. We're already metukan. So it's not like I need to do something in particular. I have to know that I am Ezer Kenegdo. I am here to help him. And by me helping him, I'm also helping my children, because eventually, if my husband, again, a happy husband, a happy wife, has happy children. Uh, it's just like one plus one is two. It's just that's the way that it is. If I, if I have a, a constant clashing between husband and wife, the children, no matter what you do, I mean, you can compensate to some degree, but they're going to be scarred. I mean, again, what was, was. I'm not saying I always had this quiet, you know, fruitful relationship with my husband. We, of course we had our, but we, you try, you have that, now, now that we've walked, we're walking away today, we have a little bit more knowledge, maybe we'll try to, to do a little bit more to create that safe net, to create that happiness. And then by doing so, by default, we're projecting out to our, to our children, Judaism is a great way of living. You have a happy marriage. You have a husband and a wife. They're mevater for one another, right? It's nice for the for the for the children to say, "This is Abba's chair." You know, this is Abba's chair. What are you saying to that? We have respect for your father, and when when Abba says something, even if I want to say something in front of the children because I'm not agreeing, I don't. And if I can't stand it, I walked out of the room. I walk out of the room. The worst thing, the Rambam says. The worst thing you could do is talk against your uh, against what your husband says to your children at the at the moment when your children are there. It's the worst thing because if they don't have respect for their their father, don't expect them to have respect for you. You're, you once you've knocked the idea of them having respect over the the father, don't don't expect them to have respect over you. You're not showing respect over your husband. They're not going to have respect over their father. 
So we have to understand that eventually we all benefit from this shita. We all benefit. Everyone benefits from it. So who, what does it matter who did it? Who, what does it matter if I'm the vater or not? I have happier children. I have a happier husband. I have a happier, maybe, maybe my, a, a more loving, sensitive, intimate relationship with my husband. What does it matter if I'm the one that started it? What, am I keeping a chart here? I'm not here keeping a chart. Forget the ego. Throw the ego out the window. It doesn't work. It doesn't work in a marriage. If I'm keeping a track of he did this and I'm always doing that, it's not going to work. It doesn't work. A marriage is not 50-50. It just doesn't happen. There's always one that's giving more. Once it'll be him, once it'll be you, that's the way it is. We're all here to work together. Shalom Bait from the word Shalem, to create wholeness. Which, uh, we started off with, with, with fragmentation and we're here to create wholeness. What does it matter if I'm the one sticking the piece in the puzzle, you know, the grand puzzle or you? We're all working towards the same goal. What does it matter if I clean the windows and you clean the floor? We're all working to clean the house. That's what we're doing. So why are we keeping a cheshbon? It's all Yetzirah. Oh, what do you want to be a shmata for your husband? What? You know, let, let him do it. Well, let him do something. Don't listen to it. I'm here to make sure that my home is running properly, that there's wholeness, that there's healthiness. They see a happy mother. At the end of the day, like I said, you're investing in who? Do you know who we're investing in? We're investing in ourselves. Because who's my husband? He's me. Because he carries half of my neshama and I carry half of his. So even if I invest with him, okay, let's just say I'm investing in him and I'm always giving him, but I'm investing in myself. It's like putting money in a pension fund. You're going to see that money back. One day you're going to see that money back. You're going to get reward for everything that you're doing. It's not like it's going the Timahon. It's not going down the, the, the Grand Canyon. You're going to see it back. So don't let the Yetzirah convince you that you're doing something and you're being the, the sucker in the family. You're not. You're investing for the sake of the running ability and the smoothness and the easiness of the family. Any other questions? Any other thoughts? I don't know how long we've been talking. but uh, Oh, yeah, we've been talking for a while. Anybody have questions? Anyone want to? I can stop the MP3 if you want to ask even intimate, you know, more private questions. I mean, I can always edit it anyway. <laughs> okay, that that was a sigh. That was a sigh of, oh my goodness, how am I gonna do this? Oh no. Yes, I with that sigh. Yes. Uh huh. If you want to place your trust in Hashem, but you you have the nature of a controlling nature, whereas then you feel like you can do anything you want to. And a lot of women are like that. They're independent. They feel like, well, I can do it. I can do anything. Anything I set my mind to, I'm sure I can do it. But but you'll try to do everything and obviously you'll fail. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to find room for Hashem's power to, with your power. So sometimes I struggle with that and I have to push myself and say, I can't do this, it's up to him. It's very, very hard to let go. How do, is there any, like, you know, when I when I try to ask him for help, I in my mind I think, but I really probably could do it myself if I try harder. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Okay, can you give me like an example? Because I'm wondering if this falls into the question of Hishtadlus and, and Bitahan, or is it just a controlling question? It's just like, you know, I can be the best mother, I can be the best wife, I can do everything perfectly. I don't need your help, Hashem. I'm trying harder. And I know you're there, and thanks for all your help, but I'll only let you. I'll, I know I'll, I'll, I'll only bother you when I really need it. But I probably will be fine, you know, that kind of thing. Oh, that's very interesting. Well, and first of all. You're only doing it because you want to, you really want him to be proud of you. Right. But you have this perfectionist nature, whereas you don't really need his help yet. Right. So it's hard to find that connection. To okay. Okay. So I'll, I'm going to tell you something. Now, that doesn't mean um, when Hashem creates some sort of a, a, a lacking, a, a lacking in the shlemus. In other words, I feel like I need help. I feel like I can't do something. Uh, for instance, um, uh, I'm lacking parnasa and things are really, really hard, but I could take upon myself to work a couple more hours, you know, in my, my part-time job and make some extra money and so, hard, so, so forth. And I don't, like you said, I don't have to now go to Hashem. I don't have to ask him for any favors. I'm okay, Hashem. I can make it on my own. The problem with that is, if you look, and I'm, I'm sorry to sound so drastic, but that's just by way of bringing about a, a point. It's not, God forbid, to say anything, you know, God forbid, wrong for you. But Hashem is mefarness and gives and serves even the animal's needs. An animal doesn't have to pray. 
He, a dog doesn't have to pray. A stray cat even has their food. Ants have their food. Everyone has their food. They don't have to pray. So they get what they need. You too will get what you need. You don't have to pray. But who's missing out when they pray? Who's missing out when they don't pray to Hashem? We. You're going to, you're 100% you're, you're right. Your, your situation will end up managing itself on its own. Either you'll, you'll, like you said, you'll take another job or you'll read another book or you'll talk to a friend and she'll give you a piece of it. What, it'll end up managing, but you missed out on one opportunity to have that Kesha with Hashem. And that's what Hashem, why does Hashem create lacking? What, they say, you know, it's written in Sefer Beratius. What was the Kalala of Adam? You're going to have to sweat and you're going to have to work hard. And we see this. Unfortunately, we, we live the curse every day. You have to go out and you have to work and you run the rat, rat race of life and struggle all your life to make your parnas. Da, 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 da. That's your curse. That, that's your curse. But the curse of the serpent, what? That you're going to crawl on the, on, the, on the earth and everywhere you go, you'll find your food. That doesn't sound like a curse to me. What do you mean? Everywhere I go, I'm going to find my food? That's not a curse. I would love to have that kind of curse, right? Hashem says, no, because you'll never need me. You'll never once ask for help from me because you'll have everything that you need. That's a curse. In fact, is going to work is not just a curse because we have to go to work. But you know why going to work is a curse? Because when I go to work... I'm creating a mechitza, I'm creating a veil between Hashem's hashgacha on my parnasa and me as if making the money. I'm creating that illusion that I really am the one who made my money. What do you mean? Of course I have more money in the bank. I worked five extra hours. I worked overtime this month. No, 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 no. has nothing to do with your overtime. Hashem wanted to give you more money this month, so he made you work overtime. You were meant to have that money. You have to, you have to know, it's not that I worked overtime so I had more money. No, Hashem wanted to give me more money, and that's why he created the circumstance of me having to work overtime. You see how our minds just so mishkabobbled? You see how we don't think Amuna clearly? And so I think, well, if I have everything, I don't need to talk to Hashem. I'll, you know, I'll ring the bell when I need you. But then we miss that on the opportunity. So instead of us saying, I'm lacking, I'm angry at you, Hashem, it's like, oh, Hashem, you love me so much. You wanted to hear from me. And so you created this lacking so that I'll lift up my eyes. Daddy, can you just help me out with this? Even just three words, Abba, I really need your help in this. Do you know what you do to your neshama? Do you know how much comfort and solace and, and that's, that's the food of your neshama. We know how to feed our bodies pretty well with a table like this. We know very well how to feed our bodies. Do we know what our neshamas need to eat? It doesn't need to eat sushi, even though I, you know, the body loves it. We don't need, we need words of Kedusha. We need words of tefillah. And if our souls don't get fed, it starts to scream and depression and anger and sadness and fights with my husband and fights with my children and everything starts to come out because there's an essential part of me that's not being fed and I'm ignoring it. And that's the essential part of me. That's my connector. That's what gives me the ability to go out and work. That's what gives me the ability to be able to lift my hand and take a piece of sushi. That, that's what gives me life, is the soul. Without the soul, I have nothing. It's just a lifeless body. And so if I don't feed my soul through words of tefillah, if I don't take the opportunity when I'm in a, in a bind to say, Hashem, help me, give me clarity, guide me through this. If you don't catch me now, I'm going to about to throw a plate at someone here in the house. You know, save me, pick me, hold my hands tight because I'm going to scream in one moment here. If I don't take that time to admit my weaknesses and say, Hashem, I really need you in my life, I've missed out on my opportunity to feed my, my soul. And, that, and that's an essential part of my living. And, and that's, it also is it's good for me to say I can't do everything on my own. Why? Because it's nice to have success in somewhat account, like it's me, I'm, I succeeded, and wow, look what I got to in my life. I, I, I worked so hard, and look at the house I built, and the family I have, and the cars that are sitting in my drive, and the bank account that I have. But what happens when a person meets failure? Wait a minute, if the successes are dependent on me, then so are my failures. Who promises me I'm going to be able to uplift myself when I meet failure? And we all do, world is around. World goes around. It's so funny. I'll tell you a story. It's a real story. A guy goes to the Kotel 
and he's screaming on the top of his lungs. I'll, I'll say it in Hebrew, then I'll say it in English. Abba! Taseli Pancho! Abba, create for me a flat tire! And he's screaming on the top of his lungs at the hotel. Abba! Taseli Pancho! Make a flat tire for me! And everyone's looking at him like the man it fell off the moon. What do you mean have a flat tire? And he's screaming for an hour. Give me a flat tire. Give me a flat tire. He leaves the hotel. Some guy says, I got to find out about this one. I have to know what kind of a tefillah was this. He goes after him and he says to him, what were you davening for? What kind of a tefillah is that? You know, make a flat tire for me. He says, what do you want? You want your car? I mean, your car, want, you want to have a flat tire? I don't know. You want to stay in the hotel? Like, what is that? He said, no, the world is a round circle. When you're up, you're up. And when you, you know, you realize that eventually it's going to go around. I'm up now. So I want Hashem to do a, make a flat tire so that I'll stay up and I won't have to go back down. So, so yeah, so the whole idea is we have to know, even if I'm successful right now, I have to know if I, if I take that, that it's all because of me, that it's all me, that I did it. First of all, I have a problem because I might be so egocentric and arrogant and stuff that there's going to be a problem just in general. But also I have to know that one day the world, everything is around. One day what happens when I'm not successful, when I don't have such a good day, then I'm going to be really down on myself, and that's also dangerous for me. So I have to, let, have to know my right place. My right place is I have talents, I am great, so long as I'm connected to Hashem. That's what Moshe Rabbeinu was. He was Anav. How can you be humble when he writes for himself in the Torah, Isha Elohim? Wait a minute, you're Anav, you're humble, and you write for yourself that you're Ish Elohim? Yes, because he knew that he was Ish Elohim, that the only reason why he was connected and godly is because he was connected to Hashem. He realized that his power laid in his connection with Hashem. So I can feel good about myself. I can say I'm pretty. When I, when I um, plenty of times give compliments to my kids, and I say to them, you know how I say I say, you know what, I, my daughter's Chaya Rivka. I say, you know what, Chaya Rivka, Hashem made you so beautiful. So she can know she's beautiful, but Hashem made you beautiful. And if someone will say to me, oh, you look very good, I said, thank you, Hashem made me beautiful. So that we understand the place. It's okay to feel beautiful. It's okay to say that I'm smart. It's okay to say that I have talents, but I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. I right away understand my place. That's healthy self-confidence. That's knowing my place. That's a great balance between anava and sneas and, and also, you know, proper self-confidence. We, we, again, we have to know our place. So I have to know my place. Hashem gives me a lot of abilities. But who, why don't we go back and just start from the beginning? But who gave me my sechel to be able to manage? Who gave me my arms to function so well that I can cook dinner? that I could juggle 500 things around uh, like that, right? I can do the garbage, and I could speak on the phone, and I can wash my children all at the same time. Who gave me that? That's Hashem. Funny. So it's, it's, it's a matter of putting, yeah, putting everything in balance and acknowledging that, even if it just means, uh, thank you, Hashem, for giving me the ability to be able to do that. That already put him in the picture. All right, anything else? I also want to let everyone know that I have joined a WhatsApp group um, called Tehillim Neged Sarah. I don't know if anyone knows about it, but it's a great WhatsApp group. We finish a lot of Sifrei Tehillim. People, uh, the women post the last parak that they read in the Sefer Tehillim, and then another woman just jumps in and takes over. So if you want to join, you can also let me know. 